So your, your kind of approach has forced us to look at that. And part of that story, and a big part of that story, involves your ancestor, John Broom. So because Nicola had told us about him possibly being the illegitimate son of John Smedley, we just thought, well, we have to have a look. <laughs> we have to have a look at this. So we investigated. We found out his mother was Hannah Broom, and we found her birth reg recorded in the Ashover Parish Register. There wasn't a church in Lee Dethick and Holloway, and the parish, local parish was Ashover, so a lot of the parish records are there. So there we think it is Hannah. Um, I'm just trying to find the exact thing. I can't read it. Hannah, daughter of Charles and Martin Broom, baptised May the 3rd. And then we don't know anything more about her, unless you do, until we found what we think is the entry for John Broom's birth in the Ashover Parish Register, 1st of May 1825, for his baptism. And you'll see it just, just says, a base child. So I'm sure you've all seen that, haven't you? So that's kind of what we knew about his origins. And then we found in his obituary, I don't know whether you've seen this in the chest, Derbyshire Times and Chesterfield Herald, the coffin made of English oak with massive brass furniture bore this inscription, John Broom, born 25th of March, 1825, died 21st of October, 1897. So that fits, doesn't it, with, yeah. with our date. So we thought, well, that's, that has to be him. And then what seems to have happened is that Anne... Hannah, sorry, marries William Else, who is living with his mother at a place called Low Lees. We did have a look for Low Lees. Uh, it just means low-lying fields, doesn't it, Low Lees? But we're not really sure where that is in Ryber, but Ryber is up the road here, and it's actually where John Smedley built his castle. So there's an estate around there, and it's, it will be somewhere around there. We'll continue to look how it's happening. And we tried to think, what was the link with the mill and with John Smedley? Now, obviously, they are in the area and lots of people come to work in the mill and so on. But we do know that one of the witnesses to John Smedley's will, I'll, I'll let you have this as a, you know, um, is Samuel Broom. So um, we know that Samuel Broom was one of the witnesses and he appears, Samuel Broom, in the census for Lee living with his parents Charles and Martha Broom and um, so we, we, we believe that this is Hannah's family so there's a kind of familial connection Charles and Martha Broom, the same couple was if Charles and Martha Broom the same couple who were Samuel Broom's parents he was Hannah's brother and John's uncle right. so we postulate that that is the link with yes. the company and clearly if he's witnessing John Smedley's will, he's in a trusted capacity. Um, now, we knew that John Smedley's, in the obituary, it states that John Broom's involvement at Lee Mills was short lived. And in the obituary, it says, however, after a short time, there came a severance. Now, I know that Brenda. Brenda's research thinks that the quarrel may be over religion, but we, we have nothing that might um, say that. that. I think that would be very likely with John Smedley, because by this time he had, he, he had a sort of, um, what do you call it, a moment of enlightenment, I don't know, but he, he got religion after an illness in, in about 18, between 1847 and 1852, 53, he was ill, and um, he became then fanatically religious and non-conformist, and he did fall out with all of his wife's family, who were Church of England people. Her, her father was the vicar at Worksworth, Caroline Smedley's father was the vicar at Worksworth, and a couple of her brothers became... Uh, ministers and so on and all of her n nephews and nieces uh, were Church of England and John Smedley uh, waged war with the Church of England actually throughout the 1860s really wrote a lot of things to the paper and had a big um, fight with sort of saying that they were all you know um, rich living people and they should you know they should 
properly go back to the roots of, of their faith and so on. So, so it is possible that it was a, an argument over religion. And then there's also this weird sentence that says, it was only temporary. Mr. Smedley had, had allowed his charge to enlist under his majesty's colours, but bought him off. Have you... So is this John Broom's obituary? Yes, this is John Broom's obituary. We found, obviously, the... Um, Trithui link and we tried to think how did he meet Agnes because they're a Cornish family and as you know the family moved up here because of their connection with engineering and we've got lots of mines and we've got lots of cotton mills in this area both of which need steam engines so um, Margaret did the um, who's not here today unfortunately she did the genealogical work on the Trithuis which she absolutely loved because <laughs> they're so interesting and she found them at Lytton Lane End so Lytton Mill is that very famous and horrible mill uh, in Derbyshire do you know about Lytton Mill yeah. but we're assuming that, that the Trithuis were installing engines there we didn't know much about the introduction of steam here um, until probably about 18 months ago. Uh, we, we were looking for something else and we came across a reference to a Petri steam engine and that led to a number of other things and we've, we're pretty confident now that a steam engine was installed here in August 1852 by John Smedley. And the Trithuis are in Lee uh, very soon afterwards. So it, it seems that they might have been engaged by, or Samuel might have been engaged by John Smedley to install steam engine. Um, and then obviously you, you will have found this, I'm sure, the uh, marriage of John Broom and Agnes Fletcher Trithui in the Holloway Reformed Methodist Church in 1855 so that kind of fits you know with our steam engine being installed and so on so we kind of feel reasonably comfortable about that so the new couple what's happening well we've got nothing we found nothing so far of John Broom's involvement in the mill at that stage you know at the time of his marriage we've got nothing that we found so we then looked in Leicester because we we found that they that he and Agnes turn up in Leicester so again you've probably found all of these things okay so we found him working for Henry Whale who we looked up and is a hosiery manufacturer in uh, Leicester and Walker and Kempton so again I think this is from the obituary and then census the commercial directories and another census so pretty sure that between 1860 about and 1875, they're in Leicester. And clearly, he is working his way up through the hosiery trade. Whale was a hosier, so making presumably socks and stockings and mitts and hats and so on. Walker and Kempson and Cooper, also uh, hosiery companies. So the children are coming along. I did try and look up the streets in Leicester, just to see where they are. They're pretty much all around the centre of Leicester. Um, the one I did find was Hobart Street. I thought that was quite nice. Yeah. But he was doing quite well there. I looked up uh, Arthur Street. If I go back one, I'm not very good at going back. Preview. Yeah, Arthur Street is actually by the jail. <laughs> so it's not quite so nice. But, but it's good in a way, because you can see a kind of career trajectory. Yes coming on here you know starting off as a warehouse man and living near the jail <laughs> and then moving up through nicer progressively nicer and nicer houses um, I stuck in two key dates and the two key dates for us are the death of John Smedley in 1874 and the arrival of John Thomas Marsden who takes the name Smedley becomes John Thomas Marsden Smedley so they come in he had spent a lot of time in Australia. Uh, his family had emigrated to Australia in the 1860s. We don't particularly know what he was doing there. We think he had something to do with the textile industry and uh, the, the profession that we've got him down as is kind of like a factor. He's selling 
wool, we think, in, in the, the mills in uh, Australia. Again, that's an area that we're still looking at and working. But we know that when John Smedley dies, he's already come back to this country and he's running a, a strap works in Stroud, which is where his wife is from, and they come up then to uh, run the mill. And as I mentioned to you earlier, a year after his arrival here, he's a young man of 33 when he takes over and on John Smedley's death. A year later, he is dead. We sent for his death certificate, and clearly it was an accident. The, the story in the family is that he fell from a horse in, in Matlock. He died in London, and we've got the deathbed account of his wife, and it's a, it's a really horrendous stream of consciousness. Um, but in that, she says that at one point he says, Oh, Nancy, they've cut me such a gash. And we thought, well, had he had an operation? You know. So we sent for the death certificate. And he died of uh, an injury called constriction of the urethra. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I talked to a doctor about that. And he said that that's quite... Uh, it's not an uncommon injury in Australia, actually. <laughs> because they're all jumping on, top of, jumping on and off horses and jumping on and off um, quad bikes and things and damaging their lower abdomen. And if you damage your bladder and bladder area is a, a man, that's what can happen. And whether he had an, ac uh, an, an operation to try and alleviate that or not, anyway, he died uh, about a week after the accident, we think. So this place is in consternation. He knew he was dying. He had time to appoint trustees. Interestingly, he didn't appoint his wife, did he? Or her family, because her father had, was a very dodgy character, we think. A bit of a shark-like businessman. So trustees were appointed... And they have to run the mill. By that time, they've hived off... John Thomas did hive off the hydro as an independent company. So, there is a man called Wild Goose involved in the story. He was managing the mill. And we think, we think it might be Wild Goose who brings in John Broom. This is, by the way, where John Broom was working just before he comes to Smedley's. This is a massive factory, Cora's factory in Leicester, very, very big company. And I think that this is critical in the story as to why Wild Goose bring, brings Broom over, because Broom is now getting quite senior at Cora's. Cora's, interestingly, registered the St Margaret trademark. It was first registered on the 13th of August, 1875. And as you can see there, it's, they claim it's the oldest trademark for knitted goods on the register. So I got that quotation from a, a book, not a very good book, but it's the only book on Cora's history. He doesn't, um, he doesn't give any sources in the book. But anyway, this is true. We know that, that they did register the trademark. And a document was prepared for the High Court of Justice because when John Thomas died, we had trustees in place for the infant John Bertram and Arthur Stanley. And everything had to go through the High Court of Justice. So it must have cost them an absolute fortune. So even when Nancy wanted to put a library on her house in Bournemouth, she had to go and ask the trustees for money. So we've got quite a bit of correspondence. So we've got a document that, <coughs> excuse me, prepared for the High Court of Justice. Chancery Division is our first direct evidence of John Broom's employment here. It was submitted by the trustees of the will of John Thomas Marsden Smedley, and that's William Bell Hunter, was chief physician at the Hydro, Robert Wild Goose, and Anne Weeks Marsden Smedley, who is the widow. So they urged the acceptance of John Broom's offer to remain at Lee Mills. And, and it's a kind of indication, really, that he's arrived and then he actually puts in his resignation. So this, this, all, this business is is really about his terms and conditions. So I think he's laying down his, his terms and conditions. So um, he actually says he intended to resign so he could become a partner in a competitor's business. The plaintiffs urged the acceptance of John Broom's offer to remain at Lee Mills if his share of the commission on sales was increased from a quarter of a percent to half a percent on the grounds that his continued presence as, as manager was essential for the continued prosperity of the mill. 
So he's, he's kind of a canny operator, I think. I worked out, and I think I'll put it on the next slide, how much that actually comes to. So um, the other interesting thing is that, that it says John Broom has uh, been instrumental in materially developing the business by introducing self-acting machinery. So we know, and again, that was a fairly recent find, before, independent of this search, we discovered that, you know, the knitting plant, the knitting factory that we saw, that was built at exactly the time that we're talking about, 1875-1876. And so it wouldn't be... It could be a working hypothesis that Wild Goose and Broom are saying, you've got to get the... You know, you've got to expand this, you've got to put those cotton's pavement machines in there. So these are not machines that they'd invented or developed, they're machines that they're buying from cottons in Loughborough and putting into the, the knitting plant here. So Broom is in a very he's in the driving seat here, definitely. So um, he was appointed, as we know, from ma as manager. So this document that was prepared for the High Court of Justice says that he was a mill manager. And his first threatened resignation, because he did, did do it again later, <laughs> resulted in an agreement that his commission should increase from a quarter to half percent of total sales. So it's a lot of money. So all the time that, that JB is growing up, from the age of nine to the age of 18, Broom and Wild Goose are running this place. And they're doing a really, really good job because the mill does, does do really well. Oh. Going in 1876, uh, John Smedley Limited, well, it weren't John Smedley Limited, John Smedley trademarked the, the J, the J bird. And this, you can't really see this, but this is the registration. I'm sure it's J for John Smedley. And it's a really nice cipher. So the S is a branch in this bird. J, the J for John. There are also a lot of J's in this valley. I've never seen so many J's as I see around here. There's, there's always a lot around. They're very beautiful, feisty, evocative birds. I think it's a good, you know, a good trademark. So Cora's had a saint and we had a feisty little bird, <laughs> but, but good. So trademarked in 1876, and it was actually Bell Hunter, who's one of the trustees, who, um, who goes down and registers it in London. But... It can't be Bell Hunter's idea. It has to be John Broom's idea, I think. You know, that link between Cora's and, and here. Um, we then find him in 1881 on the census. He was 56 years old. And again, he's recorded manager at Hosiery Mill, which is Lee Mills. And he's living at Lee Hall, which you'd mentioned. We're not going to see Lee Hall, but I thought you might like to see it. It's a very nice house. It's Peter Nightingale's house. So Peter Nightingale inherited a farmhouse in the 1760s and he put this beautiful Georgian front onto it. It's a lovely house and it is available for rent. So next time you all get together, put in 20 quid each and you can stay at the hall. It's lovely actually. And, so, and you can even buy it, it's for sale at the moment. So um, former home of Peter Nightingale and lived in, presumably rented, I don't think he bought it, they, people didn't seem to buy in quite the same way that they do now and they seem to move around more than, than we, we think so there's Lee Hall um, so to recap 1887 it's not a recap, this is a promotion John Broom should be hosiery manager at Lee Mills for seven years from 31st of December, 18. I knew I'd done the, I knew I'd done the uh, calculation somewhere uh, seven years from the 31st of December 1886. Now this is important because of something that comes up later. So this is the agreement. John Bertram and Arthur Stanley are growing up now. Teenagers, they're at... Did they go to Harrow? Was it Harrow they went to? And then Cambridge. And uh, Broom is still doing the work. <laughs> Paid quarterly. One and a half percent commission now. And... The, the commission on the sales was estimated at 1,200 per annum. And on the Bank of England uh, inflation calculator, that's £155,000. So that's kind of a nice salary, isn't it, really, to be earning? So he's quite well off, Mr. Broom. The 1891 census, they were living at the Woodlands, which is, if I put my glasses on, this house here, 
I, I looked it up actually on Zoopla because I thought I might get you a picture to put up. It's a million pound house that is. So uh, that's here. It's, we'll see it this afternoon. It's absolutely beautiful. So then we've got Fred coming into the mill. He's earning £96.17 and six quarterly. In 1898, he's working in the gas house. I think the three pounds t- two and six a week. These figures are difficult because we've got an annual, a quarterly, a weekly figure, and I haven't had time to do those calculations. But anyway, we have got some evidence from our wages books of Fred. So he's brought Fred into the business, and I think this is part of what happens later. Uh, in 1893, when the company is incorporated, John Bertram Marsden Smedley has come of age. So he's a 21-year-old ex uh person who... Oh, no, he's not Horovian. He, had, he was for a while, and then he went to have a private tutor, and then he went to Cambridge. But anyway, you get the picture. So he then comes into the business with Arthur Stanley and they become partners, and they take John Broom as a partner for five years in the incorporated company. And the mill was at the same time purchased from the Nightingale family. So the the two boys buy the mill, Um, Broom is a partner in the whole business, and we do have the articles of partnership. And then on the 9th of December, 1893, We have articles of partnership of John Broom with John Bertram and Arthur Stanley for seven years. They backdate it to the 1st of January that year. And in this agreement, John Bertram and Arthur Stanley become permanent directors of John Smedley Limited, and John Broom is appointed the third director and hosiery manufacturer, but for five years, from the 1st of January, 1893. And this time he gets a salary plus £200 a year for acting as director but it's not so bad because it equates again by the Bank of England calculator as £293,660 a year. So although he's given up the commission for a salary it's a pretty hefty salary. Um, He moves to Lee Home so in the Kelly's directory of 1895 they're living at Lee Home which we'll see this afternoon this was a house that belonged to the company John Bertram actually lived there for a while as well with his new wife when he came to run the mill and then they moved to an even bigger house called Lee Green which is between here and Lee Village so this house John Smedley owned passed it down to John Thomas and then to John Bertram and then it's become a company property and subsequently other managers have lived in that house. It's a very, very nice house. Um, The director's minutes of this time make numerous references to John Broom so we can see the sort of things he's doing. Mr Broom is travelling to London to meet the wholesalers and that's people like Ian R Morley and George Brettel. We sold primarily through commercial wholesalers. So we don't have very much advertising material in the 19th century because we were using commercial wholesalers to do that for us. He uh, was reporting steps required to hasten deliveries and orders, so he's kind of involved in all aspects of the company, as he should be as manager. Responsibility for pensions, stock-taking, new machinery. And interestingly, there's a dispute of 1897 with a lady called Mrs Moran and I didn't go into any detail about that but um, we, we have got the paperwork connected with that dispute Broom was responsible for paying her off really so I think the, the nub of that story is that Mrs Moran is someone who works here she says that she designed uh, they were called breast gauze in combination so it's a way of knitting so that you can shape a garment to fit round a woman's bosom it's a very difficult thing to do in knitting, if you can imagine, because knitting's flat, isn't it, unless you seam it. But she devised this way of making a sort of increase in the stitches so you could do this, uh, this breast gore, as they called it. And uh, the company said it was a John Smedley innovation, and she said it was her invention. And Broom is a company man, and he gets her paid off. So, so it becomes a company thing. 
And then he resigns again. So he resigns in November 1894. Now, irritatingly, we only have this in the director's minutes. So we have one side of this story. Um, and we only have the, the minutes. How would you describe our minutes? They're kind of sparing, aren't they? They're, they're irritatingly brief. Um, so how it reads, I'll try and, and tell you a little bit uh, more about this. So it seems that Broom was kind of had occasionally a tempestuous relationship with the company. So on the 10th of November 1894, it was reported in the director's minutes that he had handed in his resignation. A fellow director, Mr Edward G. Clark, who was the accountant, uh, addressed John Broom to say he did not trust himself to report accurately on the conversation he had had with Mr Broom about the reasons for his resignation, and he appealed to Mr Broom to address the board directly. John declined on the grounds that the subject was a painful one. He did ask that the matter should be resolved immediately, so he didn't use any time in establishing his future means of livelihood. John Broom then retired from the room. And guess what? The decision was taken to defer the decision until the next meeting. John Broom's letter of resignation is not in the archive, and we can't be sure what the reasons for resigning were. So that's a real frustration for us. We didn't know what that's about. Maybe you know? No? Anyway, on the 8th of December, they, the board met again, and the directors offered to extend John Broom's contract for an additional two years. It's quite complicated, this, so that's why I'm reading it. Two years beyond the existing termination date of the 31st of December 1897, John Broom agreed to withdraw his letter of resignation. It was suggested to him that for the remainder of the present term of the agreement, his remuneration from every source should only be £2,000 per annum instead of 2500 as his engagement had been extended for a further two years at a salary of £1,000 per annum. In spite of his decision to withdraw the letter of resignation, this cut in pay clearly rankled because the archive does have a copy of a letter uh, from the director Edward G. Clarke to John Broom, which was dated 17th of March 1895. So there are a couple of extracts from that letter here. So this was written in reply to a request from Broom for greater remuneration if his contract was to be extended. He writes, You know how from first to last I have been anxious to keep you at Lee Mills as long as possible and on, the terms of the re on, on terms the reverse of niggardly. And this anxiety has laid me open in some quarters to the mild reproach of being very generous with other people's money. So obviously he's alluding there to the young JB and Arthur and the an enormous preponderance of the two brothers' state, stake in the firm. Clark continues, This fact, which cannot be gainsaid, leaves me, I think, free to say now that in my judgment, and especially having regard to your wishes being already met by the admission of your son you might fairly extend the terms for two years after the expiration of the present agreement on conditions not greatly in excess of those which you first named when the idea was first broached, viz. the spreading of the whole period of the balance to come to you under the existing agreement. So basically what they're saying is they'll pay him the same amount of money but spread over longer for in, in return for having Fred in the business, I think is how we read it. So, uh, for the spreading of the whole period of the balance to come to you under the existing agreement, coupled with some substantial reduction in the days or hours of attendance at the mill. So, he is approaching retirement age by this time, and so that, again, is a concession of the company for paying him less, <laughs> effectively. Sincerely hoping we may arrive at a wise and friendly solution. So I think our conclusion of this is that Edward Clark implies that Arthur Stanley and the controlling person in this, John Bertram, are unwilling to meet John's terms fully. And there's further implication that they believe John should feel beholden to them for allowing Frederick to gain employment at Lee Mills. So we then have 
a letter from John uh, to say, this is his reply to Edward Clark's letter. It states he was not prepared to back down. I cannot tell you how sorry I am that you are not yet free from those oft-recurring matters of diplomacy, but I do congratulate myself that this matter is not of my making. And he underlines both this and my. On a careful review, I don't think I, I can alter anything I said at the last board meeting, i.e. that it will be best to let things run as they are, and if towards the end of the present arrangement I am fit and there is a place for me, matters may then be very easily settled. I feel nothing for you but the gratitude and affectionate respect to which your kindness to me entitles you, and much regret that we cannot in this matter find a meeting place. We've got no, we've got really no uh, reference to the outcome of the negotiations in the director's minutes until over two years later, when on June the 12th, 1897, an agreement was signed authorising the chairman to pay Mr Broom £500 to represent the difference in his salary in the periods covered by the new and the previous agreements. And one possible explanation for this is the apparent strains in the relationship between JB and John Broom may have been political because John Bertram was a stalwart conservative whereas John Broom according to the obituary uh, was more of a, a liberal so maybe they fell out over politics we we don't know I think it's quite easy to fall out with people <laughs> over both politics and religion isn't it um, we know from one of JB's letters to his mother's written when he was a student at Edinburgh which is where he was for a while that JB went to heckle Gladstone on one occasion so you know they may not have seen eye to eye on politics and then there's an extraordinary uh, entry in the minutes for the 4th of January 1895 so this um, uh, this was at the time of the ongoing dispute over the... Sorry to read this out, but it, it is really complicated and I, and I want to be right what I'm saying. Um, this was, of course, the time of the ongoing dispute over the renewal of Broom's contract and may reflect his disgruntled state of mind. His comments may accurately reflect, reflect the competence of the Middleditch brothers um, who are cousins of J.B. Marsden Smedley. So, we've got... These two young men, John Bertram and Arthur Stanley, coming into the firm. We've got John Broom and Wild Goose, long in the tooth, established, competent mill managers. You can imagine what it's like running this place. You know, at that time there were 900 employees, not just all here, there were some outworkers. Big factory, lots of room for niggles with the workforce. You know, you've got to be a certain type of very competent manager to run. You've seen how complicated knitting is. It, it's, and these two young men breeze in. Um, you can imagine the conflict there. And then they want to bring in their cousins. Now, if you remember, they lost their father, age nine and seven. Their mother, Nancy, her sister, Georgina, married somebody called William Henry Middleditch, who was a bank clerk. And uh, William Henry Middleditch had a clutch of children who were therefore first cousins of J.B. and Arthur. And what we see as, as J.B. and Arthur are coming of age, they're suggesting that the Middleditch brothers come in as directors and are coming into the firm. And I can fully understand that really not going down very well with Mr. Broom at all. And Mr. Broom writes some quite strongly, well, there's some strong words in the board minutes. So, Mr. Broom, his comments may accurately reflect the competence of the Middleditch brothers, cousins of the chairman. So, in response to a request from Percy and Henry Middleditch for seats on the board, they have been working here, I have to say, John Broom declared that he declared, Don, sorry, John Broom declared that he considered Percy Middleditch incapable of earning his salary. The decision was then taken to refuse Percy's application for a seat on the board and Percy wanted a salary increase of £800 a year. That was also refused and Mr Broom's say-so was, um, was instrumental in that. In addition, John Broom expressed himself confident that if both the middle ditches left, it would not be difficult to replace them, especially <laughs> Percy. So again, this will be 
a cause of difficulty within the kind of, within the mix, won't it? In response to John Broom's forthright opinion, I think you could say, the directors agreed to offer Henry an increase of £100 a year and the promise of a seat on the board when Mr Broom left the management of the factory. And that was on the condition Henry would get a place on the board if he was to detach himself from his brother. Poor old Percy. Anyway, there we go. So sorry I went ahead of myself, because that was a particularly good story as well, wasn't it? So then we go on to what I say, the uh, 1897, the death of John Broom. So we know from the obituary that he died um, on the previous Friday. He died on the the 21st of October. And the Friday before that, he'd left work, the office where he had laboured so earnestly for a score of years, about noon. Going home, he was seized with an old trouble of the throat and heart which developed so rapidly in a day or two, his condition was all but helpless. So apparently the immediate cause of his death was bronchopneumonia. I don't know whether you've got that on the death certificate, but that's what it says in the paper. Um, The board, and in fact JB, write a very effusive uh, letter of condolence to Agnes, and they send a cheque for £250, which was the balance of his salary, and... Guess what? Sorry, folks. He was replaced on the board of directors by Mr. Middleditch. Which one? Henry. Uh, Henry. Percy Percy was off. Percy was out of here. He goes over to East Anglia and... Does he do hemp? He farms hemp or something, doesn't he? He makes hemp ropes in in East Anglia. And actually, we looked... He lived at somewhere called Gedding Hall. And we looked that up. And Bill Wyman lives there these days. (laughs) Have you known? So Percy did all right for himself, then. not he? Um, So I'll just read you what it says. The colleagues of the late Mr Broom on the board of John Smedley desire to place on record their appreciation of his many excellent qualities, his unserving integrity and his unceasing devotion to the interests of the firm during the long period of his connection with Lee Mills. First, as a partner and latterly as a co-director. And JB says... I have known the late Mr Broom intimately for the last eight years and I feel I have also lost a friend in whose judgment I had the greatest confidence and I know this is the individual opinion of each of his colleagues. Mr Broom's sound sense and great business capability were recognised by all here at Lee Mills but his recognition as a manufacturer was recognised in circles far wider than those in which he immediately moved. So I think there there's a recognition of what Broom did for this company between, you know, the, the death of J.T. Marston Smedley in 1875 and 1893. So that's nearly 20 years. And when we were making amazing goods, we've got some fantastic garments in the archive, combinations, uh, long johns, vests and so on, that he would have been inter- in, intimately involved in crafting, approving and selling. JB continues, I am desired to ask your acceptance of the enclosed cheque for £271, three shillings and eight pence, which would represent what Mr Broom would have received had the original agreement not been cancelled in June last and had he survived to the close of the year. As the company had not the benefit of his services past, the time originally covered by the first agreement, we all think that the old agreement should be acted upon. Your son will explain further details to you, should you desire them, for I think he understands how matters stand. In conclusion, may I say that I feel I have lost an old and valued friend and counsellor in whose opinion I had the greatest confidence. Mr Broom's sudden death must have been a great blow to you and to all his family, and you have my sincerest sympathy in your bereavement. So I don't think there's any reason to doubt John Bertram's sincerity in that. You know, they may, there may have been this disagreement and there's been the kind of ups and downs of, of anybody's um, working lives. Um, but I think that is a very touching and um, sincere tribute to somebody I'd be very, I would be very proud to be related to. So JB was only 22 when he took over as chairman and 29 when he died. So that kind of fatherly and steadying hand from an experienced uh, manager would have been genuine. Um, And as I say, we assume that that Wild Goose, who ran the factory between 1875 and 1890, Wild Goose was the person that 
that suggested Broom's involvement. Um, I haven't put this in, but and you probably know it, but probate records state that in 1897, John Broom bequeathed £9,897, one shilling and nine pence to Agnes Fletcher Broom. And I didn't work that out on the, on the Bank of England calculator. I have been up to the graveyard and found his tombstone and there are quite a lot of brooms all together in the one place this is just a little bit it's it's not in great condition it wouldn't take much to tidy it up a bit anyway no. would it but it but it anyway it's there um, and they're all there which is which is rather nice do you want to have lunch i've got a little bit on fred should we, should we just finish that off yes. Yes. all right don't know much about fred um but uh he was we found in the census Yes, we were intrigued by this. He seems to have been a pharmacist or been training as a pharmacist. I think he read chemistry. No. At the time of the 1881 census, he's living on a high street in Codner, which is over towards Nottingham from here. It's a mining area. With the family of Thomas Farnworth, who is a pharmaceutical chemist, and he's down as chemist's apprentice. Um, so it's the earlier census, isn't it, when he's at Woodlands, of course, where he's got the Japanese guest, which we've never come... We've never worked out. But I did wonder, my, did, my wonder on this is that we've always said that our involvement with Japan dates from about 1913. But why is there a Japanese guest staying with John Broom in the 19th century? And I do feel that our involvement with the Japanese market certainly predates that. And I thought it was through INR Morley. But I'm wondering whether John is in the mix somehow don't know um, Fred is here on the picture of the Lee Mills silver band I think this is one of the middle ditches so I think this is Fred this is JB looking a little bit mournful I don't know whether he had an interest in music or anything, but he's on the band photo anyway so the silver band story is an interesting sideline it existed for a very short while JB is responsible, I think, for supporting it. He bought all the instruments and the uniforms, and they entered all of the prestigious band competitions. One of the volunteers is actually researching the story of the Silver Band now. Um, so they were up against the grime, you know, the black grime thought colliery and the black mills, black. Band. We've got one very big trophy in the archive. They were as good as those bands. And we also were contacted by somebody who's been cut off the picture, actually. He's further on the other side. But you can see these trophies, look. You know, they're, they're, it's a good band. And he bought tip-top uh, instruments. We've, we've only got the drum in the archive. We've got the drum, but nothing else. So they, there's, um, there's a man who's knocked off the photograph called Foster... This guy's got them as well. These badges, I think, represent, you know, various championships. So uh, we have been contacted by a descendant of a man called William Foster, who came here, and he said his father came from Yorkshire and became a carpenter here. But actually, he was recruited to be the bandmaster, you know. And... Um, so he was paid as the carpenter, but he basically, he sorted this band out, I think. So they really do incredibly well. But anyway, he's on the picture of the band, and I can only assume he had an interest in, in the band somehow. So you might, I thought... <laughs> now, I haven't said, but John Broom also got shares in the company. And when he died... Um, as they still do, some of the shares were taken back. Fred Broom attended every AGM, we think, <coughs> until 1911, when his place was taken by his brother John. At that AGM, the 52 remaining shares were divided up. 20 went back to the company, to the directors, 5 to John, and 27 divided between the four sisters. So that's just another little snippet of information so in our AGM minutes, it says, the AGM of the 11th of May, it's reported that in order to wind up the trust formed on the death of the late Mr. John Broom, the trustees, who were Mr. John Broom and Mr. Frederick S.J. Broom, wished to dispose of the 52 shares they held in the company. It was decided that 20 shares would go to the directors or their nominees, 
five shares would be retained by John Broom and the remaining 27 shares would pass to Miss Mary Broom, Miss Agnes Broom, Miss May Robbins Broom and Miss Constance Edith Broom. Um, so then there's an interesting and uh, again a, a little bit of um, kind of one side of the story really. So we've got a letter from this man called J.W. Gregory or Wilson Gregory Senior as he was known here and it's dated the 13th of May 1899 and it, it cast uh, Fred in rather a a negative light but as I stress this is one side of the story and we have reason to think Mr Gregory wasn't exactly uh, a saint himself so I'll tell you a little bit about the story so in the letter that Mr Gregory sends to the chairman he complains bitterly about his treatment at the hands of Frederick Broom J.W. Gregory was in charge of the dinner house According to him, once a year when the dinner houses were whitewashed, Mr Broom Senior had allowed him to employ a few extra women to help in the dinner house, to help the dinner house employees carry out the work. They were paid two shillings a day, which, as Mr Broom Senior said, was little enough for that kind of work when they had no refreshments allowed. Mr Gregory had carried out those instructions ever since, and he told his son to do the same. So we're getting a kind of series of number of dynastic things going on here. So we've got dynasties of Gregory's as well as Broom's. Mr Broom sent for his son and was very angry with him and told him there was no need to bring in outside help as the girls in the dinner house had little enough to do. Now my knowledge of dinner ladies is you don't say things like that to dinner ladies. <laughs> um, Mr Broom sent for the girls, uh, so yes, Mr Gregory's son told the dinner house girls this. And they all refused to do it. And so Mr F. Broom sent for the girls and gave them a week's notice, telling Mr Gregory's son that he was within a hair's breadth of having to go too. Mr F. Broom also told Mr Gregory Senior that if he didn't like the way things were, he could go as well. <laughs> uh, so Fred had told Mr Gregory a few months ago, I think, that the dinner house expenses were heavier than they used to be. Gregory denied it, challenged him to prove it. So clearly there's a, you know, as I say, there's both sides of the story here. Fred ignored him, if I may call him Fred, that's a bit impertinent, isn't it? And cut the number of dinner house girls from four to two. According to Mr Gregory, this led to chaos at mealtimes, with the workers having them to help themselves of two tables. Mr Gregory also claimed that he had to start work at 5.30am in order for food to be ready on time and often he didn't leave till 6pm. When he spoke to Mr Broom about being allowed a little extra wage for his long hours, he was told that if he didn't like it, Mr Gregory could leave. <laughs> and then that's when Gregory writes, it's no, attempt, it's no use attempting to reason with Mr Broom. I've not forgot Mr Broom Senior when he said he will have an enemy and that he was dangerous about the lies. I don't quite know what he's referring to there. Mr Gregory went on to state he has spoken to Fred Broom several times about the unhealthiness of the dinner house because the men complained they could sell, smell the sewer gas coming through the crevices in the floor. So this is kind of storm in a teacup stuff, isn't it? But clearly, you know, anything that involves health and safety and lunches, Fred's on dangerous ground. And this Gregory man has gone above his head and, and written directly to Martin Spendley, and that's what's remained in our archive, you see. So apparently when the sanitary inspector was looking over the dinner house with Mr Broom, Mr Broom gave Mr Gregory the wink to be very careful what he said to the inspector. Mr Gregory feels sure that Mr Broom is trying to rob him of his good reputation. Oh, forgive me for the feelings I have towards him I won't express. So, as I say, one side of the story. We've got no evidence of how JB responded to the letter and there's absolutely no indication that this went on to affect Fred's position at the mill. So it, it, it kind of, you know, in a sense you could say it represents an unflattering view of Fred's management style. But equally, I think, you know, we all know that on, you could catch someone on a bad day or Gregory could have just been an absolute thorn in his side. He probably was a complete pain in the neck. So this is the only letter we have with his Fred's handwriting on. 
It's dated uh, 6th of July 1906 and it reports on business in the spinning department. It's not terribly interesting, I'm afraid, but it does state that cotton uh, business was brisk, but a good deal of uneasiness prevailed amongst the holders of large stocks of wool over what was going to happen to the prices. Actually, if you look at much of our, <laughs> much of our uh, correspondence on that, it's, it's a very up and down trade, but clearly he's got an eye on it. So the end comes in uh, 1913. I think in a way that perhaps exasperated the chairman, but anyway, basically, what seems to have happened is that Mr. Broom uh, was using his ingenuity and enterprise, and he set up uh, he set up a, a little enterprise on the side, so to speak. So, um, according to the board minutes on the 21st of October 1913, the chairman reported that he had heard that a company called Else Brothers had started in Matlock, and that Mr. Broom, the company's spinning manager, was together with Mrs. Broom, the principal shareholder, holding four-fifths of the capital. When confronted, Mr. Broom did not deny that he was mainly instrumental in the setting up of this company and in developing the carding machine with an engineer friend, whose name he was unwilling to disclose. After consulting with his co-directors, the chairman informed Mr. Broom that he could not allow him to continue to be at the same time an employee of the company and the chairman of the and the chairman and and board of, sorry the chairman of the board of directors and manager of Else Brothers who were carders and dealers in wool and cashmere. Now this is really good because Mr. Broom asks for time to consider his position and to see a friend in Ghent. So we then have to wait until the 31st of October when it was reported that Mr Broom, upon his return from Ghent, told the chairman that his friend could give no decisive reply for six months and ask for deferment of a final decision about his position. Uh, So you will not be surprised to know that JB said uh, no. And uh, he said that this was unacceptable and Mr Broom resigned, receiving six months salary in lieu of notice. And the wages book shows him leaving employment at the mill on the 25th of October 1913 with six months' salary to the 25th of April in lieu of notice.